welcome to this video. Uh, in this one I will be covering section B of um, the June 2022 Physics A for OCR uh, of the second paper, which is Exploring Physics. So let's get right into it. For 16A, the question says, a graph of displacement S against distance X for a progressive wave starting at t equals zero is shown below. And for the first part, we need to determine the phase difference phi in radians between the points on the wave at x equals 1.5 centimeters and 2.5 centimeters. So as you may recall, the formula of phase difference is given to you by phi equals 2 pi d over lambda, where d is the distance between the two points, and that's given to us, and lambda is the wavelength, which we can simply figure out from the graph over here. So if I just take the peak to peak distance, that's basically a wavelength of 3 minus 1, so 2 centimeters. And I don't have to worry about converting any uh, centimeters into meters here because the distance is also in centimeters. So if I just plug that in, it's just going to be 2 pi times pi, 2.5 minus 1.5 over 2 centimeters. And that will give me pi radians as the answer. So for the second part, it says the displacement s at time t equals 3 quarters of the time period at x equals 1.5 centimeters, where t is the time period, obviously, of the oscillations. So for this one, you have to be very careful because this is not a stationary wave. This is a progressive wave. And for progressive wave, the amplitude remains the same okay, throughout. So amplitude is the maximum displacement or, well, in the opposite direction as well, um, from the resting position. So if we look at the point uh, where, well, if we look at the point where they're talking about three quarters of the original time period, that happens to be right at this point, okay? And because the wave is oscillating downwards, the amplitude or the displacement is going to be minus five centimeters. Okay, so just be very careful here, because I know it's very easy to go and say zero, but the displacement or the amplitude remains the same for a progressive wave throughout. Okay, so yeah, let's move on to part B now. Okay, so it says a beam of coherent light wavelength, uh, lambda, is incident normally at two parallel slits. Um, a series of bright and dark fringes are formed on a distant screen placed parallel to the, uh, to the line joining the slits. And here's the diagram, and it says further that the bright fringes are formed at M, O, and Q. Okay, so I'll just mark them in. So bright fringes are formed at M, O, and Q. And then the dark fringes are formed um, at the other two points, which are N and P. Okay, great. So we need to work out the phase difference in degrees and the path difference, D, in terms of the wavelength lambda for the waves uh, from the two slits meeting at point P. Okay, so at point P, if I just start by labeling um, each fringe, okay, so we know that the uh, fringe at M is a central um, maxima, and then you have N, which is the first order minima, okay, and we know that it is 180 degrees, okay, in terms of phase difference. And I'm just gonna also mention the path difference because it will just help me work out um, for P, okay? So that's half lambda. And for a, a minima, which is formed at P, it basically goes up in odd multiples of either 180 degrees or pi radians. So um, for O, we know, I mean, either, I mean, we don't really need O, but I'm just gonna mention it. So first order maximum, okay, and that's going to be 360 degrees as that's like the even multiples of um, pi or 180 degrees. And so, as I said, this one is second order, okay, uh, max, oh, sorry, minimum. And that is going to be 540, okay, degrees in terms of degrees and 1.5 lambda. Okay, so this is something you're expected to know that for a minima, uh, minimum, um, fringe, uh, that is basically destructive interference, you have a um, phase difference of 180 degrees times by n, where n is basically 1, 3, 5, and so on, okay, odd multiples. And then for the uh, path difference, you basically have n plus half lambda, okay? So that's, again, going to be um, 540 degrees and 1.5 lambda. 
Okay, so I hope that makes sense. It's worth remembering these points if you don't know them already. Um, and let's move on to our next part of the question. Okay, so for this one, we are given that a student is doing an experiment to determine the speed of sound in air by producing stationary waves inside a horizontal glass tube. Fine powder is sprinkled inside the tube. A loudspeaker is placed close to the open end of the tube. The other end is closed. The loudspeaker is connected to a signal generator to produce a frequency of 2.72 kilohertz. And the powder inside the tube forms piles at certain locations inside the tube. Okay. And for part, part I, we are to suggest why the powder piles up at the nodes within the tube. So we know that nodes are of no amplitude and that's why it piles up. It doesn't move. Okay. So the displacement is zero or the amplitude is zero. Okay. So next part is asking us to determine the speed of sound uh, using figure 16.2. Okay. So for the speed, we need our uh, usual equation of frequency times by the lambda, and we are given the frequency. We just need to work out the value of wavelength. So let's look into um, our diagram here. Now, we're given the set length, okay, for a section of the tube, which is 25 centimeters. And if we just work out how many wavelengths there are, okay, we would be able to figure out the value of the wavelengths, okay? So we know that like from this section to this section, we have half a wavelength here, half a wavelength here, half a wavelength here, okay? And then we have a quarter here and a quarter there. So essentially, it forms two full wavelengths, okay? So two lambda is therefore equal to L, which is basically, if I just put down lambda as 0 0.25 meters divided by two, which gives me a value of 0 0.125 meters. And so I can work out the speed as the frequency is given to me as 2.72 kilohertz. So 2.72 times by 10 to the three times by 0 0.125. And that would give me a value of 340 meters per second. Okay, let's move on to the next part. So for part III, we are to determine the fundamental or the minimum frequency F0 of the stationary wave that can be formed within this tube. So we are talking about the entire length of the tube, okay? And the minimum frequency that could be potentially formed is going to be quarter of a wavelength, okay? So I'm just gonna put that down over here. So quarter of, well, lambda naught, okay? Where I'm gonna have to figure out what lambda naught is from the length of the, uh, of the tube, as well as the known wavelength that we just figured out. So in terms of the length, entire length, how many wavelengths are there? So how many um, total wavelengths are there? Now, we've already worked out that there is two whole wavelengths along this 25 centimeters cube, okay? Sorry, 25 centimeters, not cube, my bad. Um, however, we are to account for another quarter um, here, or rather, let me just put this in a different color. So we have sort of half a wavelength here, half here, half here, another half, another half, and then we have a quarter right there. So that adds up to two and a quarter wavelengths. Okay, so um, that means that the length of the string, um, I keep saying string, I mean the tube, okay, the glass tube, is given to you by 2.75 lambdas. Okay, and because we know lambda, we can get the length of the tube. Okay, so this is going to give me a value of 0 0.34375 meters. Okay, now, as we said, that for a minimum frequency, we have to use a quarter of the uh, lambda naught. Okay, so this is equal to a quarter of lambda. Okay, so that means that lambda naught is equal to four times as much as the length, okay, which gives you 1.375 meters, okay. And from here now, you could work out the minimum frequency F naught by using, again, V over lambda naught, okay. So that is 340 over 1.375, and that ends up giving us a value of 247 
to three significant figures. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. This was a really, really good question. Um, and it's kind of unfair for two marks, given the amount of work, but, well, we just have to accept it, that sometimes you have to go an extra mile. Anyway, let's move on to our next question, number 17. Okay, so in this question, we are given that a light-emitting diode can be used to determine the Planck constant H when the LED is, um, well, just starts to emit light, the equation below is valid. Okay, where V is the potential difference of the LED, lambda is the wavelength of the light emitted, C is the speed of light in vacuum, and E is the elementary charge. And we need to, for the first part, determine the units, SI base unit, for H uh, using the equation. Okay, so we know that H is equal, rearranged, to EV lambda over C. Okay, now E is the charge of an electron, which is in coulombs, times by V, which is voltage or joules per coulomb, okay, times by the wavelength, which is meters, uh, meters, and divided by the speed of light, which is meters per second. So we end up cancelling things out, okay, M and M cancels out, C and C cancels out like so, and you're left with joules per per second, okay. Now joules second, in other words, can then further be written as um, joules can be broken down because it's the unit of energy. And I could have done that over there as well, which is fine, but I wanted to avoid using too many um, units uh, right there. So joules is kilograms meters squared per second squared, because it's like half mv squared, for example. Okay, and then times it by the seconds that we already had right there. Okay, so if I just clean this up, okay, I'm going to end up getting kilograms meter squared s to the minus one. Okay, so that, was, that wasn't too bad. Let's move on to our next question. So we have a six marker on describing how, well, we have to describe how an experiment can be carried out in the lab to determine H from a graph and use your description um, um, to, count, well, to show how you calculate V or how you count, uh, measure V and lambda um, accurately and assume that the values of E and C are known to you. Okay, so this is one of the um, PAGs Okay, um, and it's a relatively simple question because we are given the equation. Okay, so we know exactly what graph we should be drawing. We'll figure that out in a second. And we need to um, start off potentially with setting up a circuit. Okay, so in terms of the circuit, I'm gonna, they haven't given us enough space to draw one out, but I guess I'm gonna just draw this out in the, the on these dotted lines. So we can basically use a, um, a DC supply, um, and like so, and we can then connect it to a fixed resistor, okay, R, and then we have our LED, and across the LED we are going to have a voltmeter, like so. Okay, so we've got a, gosh, can't even draw a triangle, but oh well, okay, that is really bad, okay, one sec, so, doop, okay, okay, right, there we go, and we have an LED, so it has to have an arrow coming out, or two arrows coming out like so, and then we have a voltmeter, which is like so, and we can increase the voltage. Okay, so I'm going to just make this into a variable voltmeter so that we are able to, you know, start from zero and change the, uh, increase the voltage to about as soon as it just comes on, uh, you know, we can read that volt um, voltage across the LED and basically um, we should use a um, black cardboard tube to reduce any background lighting um, as well. So in terms of my diagram, here I have a I'm going to use one kilo ohms resistor, okay, fixed resistor, R, and a DC power supply. So, power supply, right there. Okay, so let's, uh, let's uh, bullet point this, okay, and also in terms of uh, the graph that we have to draw, um, in order to calculate the value of H, we can just manipulate the equation ever so slightly, okay, so we're given that EV is equal to HC over lambda. So if we were to obviously vary the lambda uh, and the voltage accordingly, we would be rearranging that as V equals HC 
over e, okay, and times by 1 over lambda. So I'm going to draw a graph of v versus 1 over lambda, okay, and I'll put that down nicely, but this is just for explanation purposes, okay. And I would end up getting a straight line passing through the origin, and it will help me, well, I can then get the gradient of that line and equate it to hc over e, and then rearrange to make h the subject. Okay, so I hope that all that makes sense. So I'm going to start by writing down my first point, which is to set up a circuit shown on the left and place a black cardboard tube, oops, cardboard tube to reduce any ambient lighting and then I would say to look down at the LED and start to and well start to um, increase the voltage from zero to until it just lights up or uh, just starts to emit the light. Okay, now record this threshold voltage. So record this voltage and repeat. I guess three times is enough to get an average. for the same LED. Okay, and then we can record the corresponding wavelength of the LED um, either from the manufacturer's data or we can work it out using a diffraction grating of known value of D, okay, and sine theta to determine lambda, okay? So uh, I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna say both, okay, just for clarity. Um, so record the corresponding wavelength of LED uh, using the manufacturer's, manufacturer's data or using a diffraction grating and so G and N lambda equals D sine theta equation to calculate the wavelength okay, of that LED. So that's how you would record those two values. Okay, and as I said, once you have the value of V and lambda, you could work out the graph and you're gonna repeat these experiments, these steps. for say three to four different LEDs and plot a graph of voltage against one over lambda and that would to obtain that would be to obtain gradient of the line of best fit, obviously, and then you are going to calculate H as going to be gradient times by the value of C. Um, wait, hold on, the gradient, so HC, I should just put that down, H. C over E, okay, will be the value of gradient, so H will be gradient times by the value of E divided by C. Okay, so that's your question 
um, number 17, part B, done. Okay, let's move on to question number 18 now. And here we are given a battery which is connected to a variable resistor. The variable resistor is made from a length of wire. The resistance of the variable resistor is R. The battery has an EMF of um, E, an internal resistance R. The current in the circuit is I, and we need to compare the EMF of the battery and the potential difference across the variable resistor in terms of energy transfer or changes. This is easy, right? Because, well, an EMF or electromotive force is just the amount of energy or the chemical energy that's get, that gets converted into electrical. And potential difference is basically the electrical energy getting converted into, um, say, heat over here for the resistor. Okay, so variable resistor. So I'm going to say EMF is for chemical energy into electrical from the source. And potential difference is electrical into heat energy. Okay, part B is asking us to state which physical quantity of the variable resistor is changed to alter its resistance. Well, that would be the length of the resistor. Okay, so length of the wire, basically, not of the resistor, sorry. Okay, so part C is asking us uh, to show that 1 over I equals R over E plus R over E. Okay, so let's start with uh, our known equation, which is the EMF equals V plus I times the internal resistance, and V is just I times R here, and I can just factorize the I, okay, and write it down as E over R plus little r, and that can be then flipped around, okay, so we can just, because we want 1 over I, right, so 1 over I is equal to R over R, sorry, R plus little r over E, which then can be divided individually into r over e plus r over e. So that was very, very easy. Right, let's move on to our next part, which is saying that the student varies r and measures the current, and he plots the graph like that, and we are to use a graph to determine the power dissipated in the variable resistor when r is 3 ohms. Okay, so we can use um, a formula like P equals I squared R. And at 3 ohms, the value of 1 over I, okay, so just be careful, 1 over I is equal to 0 0.8, okay. So I can work out that I is 1 over 0 0.8, okay, and that happens to be a value of um, 1.25 amps. And then just use that over here squaring it and timesing it by 3. So that would give me a value of 4.7 volts. For question number 2, it says that the EMF E of the battery is 5 volts. Determine R from the intercept of the line with the vertical um, axis. Okay, so we can work out if we just extrapolate the line. Um, so let's say that's not very good. Uh, that will do. Okay, so that is cutting right in the line in the middle. Okay, so 0 0.2. Okay, so 1 over i is 0 0.2 from the graph. That is the y-intercept. Okay, and i is equal to therefore 5 amps. And r is equal to v over i, which is equal to 5 by 5, or 1 ohms. Okay, moving on to question number 19 here. We're given that the diagram below shows two parallel plates E and C in an evacuated glass tube. Plate E is made from potassium, which is sensitive to light. Plate C is not sensitive to light. The separation between the plates is 6 millimeters, and the potential difference is 0 0.3 volts across the plates. The light of frequency 6.3 times 10 to the 14 hertz is incident on plate E. The photoelectrons emitted from this plate have a maximum kinetic energy of 0 0.3 eV, or those many joules. The photoelectrons are repelled by the negative plate, C. The ammeter reading is zero because these photoelectrons reach plate C with zero kinetic energy. Calculate the work function um, in EV, okay, of potassium. So we have a very known, very well-known equation here, which is 
HF, or the energy of the photons, uh, is equal to EK max plus the work function. Okay, so the work function is therefore rearranged as HF, okay, which is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 times by the frequency of the incident light, which is 6.3 times 10 to the 14, okay, that's your HF, minus the kinetic energy, which is 4.8 times 10 to the minus 20 joules. Okay, now I, I'm using this because um, I can convert this all together into EV in the end. Okay, so alternatively you can convert HF into EV first and then take it away from 0 0.3 uh, EV, okay, of max other kinetic energy. So that will still give you the same answer. So once I've got the this calculation, which is 3.6969 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, I would divide this by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 to get it into EV, and that is 2.3 electron volts. For part B, it says this question is about a photoelectron emitted perpendicular to the plate E with an initial uh, kinetic energy of this much. Show that the magnitude of deceleration of this photon is this much. Okay, so we can use our usual equation over here which is work done okay so work done is equal to force times distance the reason why i'm using it because we know the distance and we know the work done which is the energy uh, of 4.8 times 10 to the minus 20. so we know that force is equal to mass times acceleration and we can therefore rearrange this to make a as w divided by m times d and we know that the mass of photoelectron is given to us in the data booklet, okay, which is just the mass of electron, okay, so if I just input these values, I just have to work out the magnitude, okay, so that will be given to us, so D is, um, I believe, 6 millimeters, okay, got it, so convert this into meters by times in 10 to the minus 3, and that would end up giving you a value of 8.78 times 10 to the 12 meters per second squared, okay, which is close enough. Okay, let's move on to our next part. It says, show that the initial speed of the photoelectron is about 3 times 10 to the 5. So that's easy. Ek is equal to half mv squared. So v is square root of 2 ek over m, 2 times 4.8 times 10 to the minus 20 over the mass, which is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31, all square rooted and that would give me my answer of 3.2 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. Okay, not too bad. But III asks us to calculate the time taken by the photoelectron to travel from plate E to C. Okay, so I'm going to use SUVAT over here because I've got quite a few things. I know the distance, so let's just put SUVAT and see which equation we can use. So we are to find the time. Okay, we are given the deceleration, or acceleration is minus 8.2. 8 times 10 to the 12, um, just making sure, yep, V is 0 because they're coming to a stop, they're decelerating, okay, and initial velocity is what we've just calculated in S is the distance between the two plates, and there you have, you can use any equation to figure this out, um, which involves T, and well, V is equal to U plus AT is the simplest one of all, so T is um, 0 minus um, 3.2 times 10 to the 5 over minus 8.8 .8 times 10 to the 12, okay? And that would end up giving me a value of 3.6 times 10 to the minus 8 seconds. Okie doke. So for the fourth part, it says, using the axis shown below, sketch a graph of kinetic energy against x uh, from plate E. Well, we know that the kinetic energy, when it reaches, um, C is zero, and it's just going to be a straight line going through to zero when it reaches six millimeters. Okay, like so. So that's really straightforward there. Now, for part C, um, we have to explain in terms of photons what happens to the ammeter reading when the light of frequency greater than this is now incident on plate E. So if the frequency is greater, that means the energy of the photon is also great, greater. So E of photons 
is, well, increases. Now, that means that the photoelectrons will be emitted with higher kinetic energy, okay? So, photoelectrons have greater EK max, okay? And that means that the ammeter reading will also, well, it would have a value greater than zero, okay? Because now the electrons will be able to reach C, okay? So ammeter reading will be greater than zero. Okay, let's move on to our next question. Question number 20A says, deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen. I don't think I can ever pronounce that correctly, so I do apologize. Um, a nucleus of deuterium has a proton and a neutron, and describe the nature and the range of the two forces acting between these two hadrons. Okay, well we know that there is a strong nuclear force, because that's how hadrons interact. Okay, so strong nuclear force which is, uh, it has a uh, short range, okay, short range. And I'll mention the nature of the, um, uh, the, the nuclear force as well, that is that it's attractive between 0 0.5 to about three femtometers, and then it's repulsive below 0 0.5 femtometers, okay? Then we also have gravitational force, which is weak, but it is there because hadrons have some mass, right? So it is a longer range force. In fact, it has infinite range. Um, so I'll say it has a long, long range. And it is always attractive. Okay, right. Let's look into part B. Well, we've been given some data for a nucleus of carbon-14 and uranium-235. And we have to use the data to describe the composition of the nuclei before and after the decay in terms of hadrons and quarks. Nice, okay. Show that, also show that both nuclei have same density. Okay, I think this question is relatively straightforward given the nature okay they're asking quite a few bullet points over here um you know so what i'll do is i'll start by explaining in terms of the equation the decay equation and then we'll work out in terms of hadrons okay which is what's happening to the neutrons and protons and also what are the changes happening in terms of quarks so i'll take carbon 14 first so it's a beta minus decay so i'll just say let's start with carbon 14 nucleus and that is basically starting off with 14, and we know it's got six protons, and that's decaying into something. We don't have to worry about it. I'm just going to call it uh, X, okay? And it is also going to give me a empty neutrino, electron neutrino, okay, like so, which has zero mass and zero charge. And so X will be 14 and seven, like so. So in terms of neutrons and protons before the decay we have eight neutrons and six protons followed by after the decay we have seven over here okay and seven over here okay now what that means is that in terms of the hadrons the neutron is turning into a proton okay so that's number one okay neutron changes or turns into a proton okay and in terms of the uh, quarks okay we know that a neutron is made up of don't need to put bullet point like that okay so bullet point like this though so we have um a neutron which is udd okay and that's turning into a proton which has a quark composition of uud okay this means that in terms of quarks okay Therefore, a down quark, D quark, is turning into 
a up cork. Okay. Right, so that's in terms of hedrons and in terms of quarks, that's done. Let's talk about now uranium-235 nucleus. We'll talk about the densities later. Okay, so in terms of uranium-235, we have been given alpha decay, and we are, therefore, starting off with 235, 92, and it's turning into, again, another element which we don't have to worry about. I'm going to call it Y, and alpha is 4 and 2, like so. And so this is going to be 231 and a value of 90. So what's happening over here in terms of neutrons and protons is, let's just bring this down. That's better. Okay. Love this disruptive message. Okay. Anyway, neutron and protons. So over here we have basically... 143 neutrons and 92 protons, followed by 141 neutrons and 90 protons. So this is basically, you can see there's a clear, well, it decreases, the neutron number decreases by 2, and also the proton number decreases by 2 as well. Okay, so that means 2 neutrons and 2 protons are clearly being carried away by the alpha particle. Okay, so Neutron and proton number decreases by two each. Okay, so neutrons and protons down by two because alpha particle particle carries two neutrons and two protons. Okay, now Let's talk in terms of quarks, what's happening here. So we know that a neutron, as I said earlier, one neutron is made of a UDD quark. Okay, now it's decreasing by two. Okay, so now that means that you have two less U quarks, okay, and four less D quarks. Okay, so I'll just put that in brackets like that. Okay, so two less u quarks, okay, and four, because obviously one neutron has um, basically two d quarks, okay, so that's decreasing by a total of four, okay, and for a proton, one proton has basically u, u, d composition, so that means four less u quarks and two less d quarks, okay, so altogether, that means that there is a total of six less u quarks and six less d quarks. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So think about it. I'm sure it will make sense. Okay, so now in terms of densities, we have to prove that the density is, well, constant, same, same density. Okay, and we are given the mass of the nuclei and the radius. Okay, so let's put that down over here. So density. Let's start with the density of carbon, 14. And that is just mass divided by volume. Now the mass is in terms of atomic mass units or 14U, okay? So 14U is to be converted into kilograms and the conversion is given to you as one U or one unit is equal to 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And that is to be divided by the volume. Now, I'm gonna um, basically not worry about the four over three pi r cubed. In fact, I'm just gonna say that volume is just proportional to r cubed, okay? Because I am just getting an estimate over here. I'm not getting the exact precise value. So um, it's going to be therefore the radius, okay? Which is given to me as 2.9 times 10 to the minus 15, okay, so that's going to be cubed, 2.9 times 10 to the minus 15 cubed, and that will give me a value of 9.5 times 10 to the 17 kilograms per meter cubed. And similarly, I will work out for uranium as well, 235, and that would be, again, 235 times by 1.661 
minus 27 over the mass of the uranium nucleus, which is, sorry, the radius, which is 7.4. Okay. Cute. And that gives me a value of 9.6 times 10 to the 17 kilograms per meter cube. Okay, so therefore they have the same densities. Okay, so as you would appreciate, this question wasn't too bad at all. Hopefully all of you or most of you would have gotten six marks over here. Okay, let's move on to our next question. Question number 21, part A. It says that the diagram below shows two insulated copper coils A and B connected in circuits, like so. Both coils are individually wrapped around the same iron rod. Coil A is connected to a cell and a switch. Coil B is connected to a filament lamp. The switch is initially closed and the lamp is off. Then the switch is opened. The lamp flashes on for a brief time and then remains off. Explain these observations in terms of magnetic flux. So magnetic flux, okay, when there's a change in magnetic flux, there would be an EMF induced, right? Okay, that's basically Faraday's um, law, okay? Now, in terms of initial and the final uh, situation where, you know, it's initially closed, okay, and then it is opened, okay, um, there, is that, there is that moment when basically there is no change in flux, okay? So initially, so I'm going to say that initially when the switch is closed and also at the end, like after it has been opened for a few moments, okay, at the end when the switch remains open, there is no change in flux. So the lamp is off, no EMF induced, okay. However, when the switch is opened, there is a brief change influx okay which is linked to coil b okay it induces an emf in coil b and therefore current is able to pass through it and the lamp turns on briefly Let's move on to part B, where a student is carrying out an experiment using a search coil, and we've been given a long solenoid is connected to an alternating current supply. The search coil is placed at one end of the solenoid. The plane of the search coil is tilted such that it makes angle theta with the central axis of the solenoid. The maximum alternating induced EMF across the ends of the search coil is E0, <clears throat> and we need to name an instrument that can be used to determine E0, well, oscilloscope the best device to work this out because it basically gives you the alternating EMF and further we are given a very juicy equation okay right not seen this one before but sure it says I naught is the maximum current in the solenoid A is the cross-sectional area of the search coil N is the number of turn of the search coil F is the frequency of the frequency of the alternating current and the value of K is 4.0 times 10 to the minus 3 volts per amps per meter squared seconds. Okay, lovely. Now, it says that the magnitude of the induced EMF in the search coil can be determined using Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction, which is EMF is equal to the rate of change of magnetic flux. Sure, yes, we know that. In the experiment, angle theta is changed and E0 is measured. Suggest the quantity or quantities in the equation given to us linked to the rate part of the law. Now, rate is basically per second. Okay, and the only quantity that links to that unit is frequency. So it's just going to be F, okay? Then for the next part, it says the change of magnetic flux linkage part of the law. Well, as you change theta, the magnetic flux linkage will change as well. So I'd say the, well, sine theta 
or theta will do. Okay, so or theta, because the, both of the values will change. Okay, so then we are given that the student plots a straight line graph of E0 against sine theta, determine f, including the absolute uncertainty, write down your value of f to two significant figures, and we're given a bunch of values. Okay, so this one is worth four marks, not too bad. And all we have to do is first rearrange and see how this links to uh, the gradient of a line. Um, so we know that gradient of this is E naught over sine theta. And gradient, right, which is this, is equal to this. Okay, so we can say that, therefore, F, which is what we're trying to calculate, is equal to the gradient, right? Okay, the gradient divided by K I naught A N. Okay, so that's that. And let's figure out the value of F first. So that's just using the given values. So gradient is 0 <coughs> 0.62 over K, which is 4 times 10 to the minus 3. Okay, times by I naught, which is 8, times by A, which is 7.8 times 10 to the minus 5, followed by N, which is 5,000. Okay, 5,000, lovely. And all that results in a value of a K, 50 hertz. We've got to work out the percentage uncertainty to help us work out the absolute uncertainty in F. Okay, so this is 50 hertz to two significant figures. Okay, and let's work out what is the percentage uncertainty in F. Now, because F, um, which is the frequency, um, deals with quite a few um, uh, quantities, the gradient has uncertainty, followed by area and the current. Okay, so you would have to add all of them up. Okay, and so I'm just going to say that it is 0 0.2 over 8 times by 100. I guess I can just do it all at one in one go. Okay, so 0 0.1 over 7.8 plus 0 0.03 over 0 0.62. All that times by 100 will give me the percentage uncertainty in F, which adds to a value of 6 point sorry, 8.62%. Okay, and then we can work out the uncertainty in uh, F, which is basically times that by um, absolute uncertainty in F, which is 8.62% times by the value that I calculated, the unrounded value, which is which was 49.67 hertz, and that ends up giving me a value of 4 as the uncertainty, absolute uncertainty. Okay, so again, that question wasn't too hard if you know how to work your way around absolute uncertainty. Okay, so let's move on to our next question now. 22a states that the diagram below shows a capacitor and the capacitor contains consists of two horizontal metal plates in a vacuum. The magnitude of the charge on each plate is Q0 and the potential difference between the plates is V0. The capacitor plates have capacitance C0, the separation between the plates is D, and the energy stored by the capacitor is E0. The top plate is moved vertically upwards, and now the new separation is 2D. Okay? The charge remains the same, and the energy stored by the capacitor increases. Determine the new capacitance in terms of C0. Okay? So we know we have to find a relationship between the capacitance and the distance because that's what's changing. Okay, so to start off with, we know that capacitance is Q over V. And we can also say that Q, sorry, V can be written as E times D, where E is the electric field strength times by the distance between the two plates. So if the distance is doubled, okay, um, so if obviously this was the original capacitance, okay, so Q is the same, and E is, I'm just going to say that this is the old capacitance, okay, and now the new capacitance is going to be quite simply Q over 2ED, okay, or E times 2D, doesn't matter, and you can see that therefore the new capacitance is half of the old capacitance, right, because this essentially is you know, the old capacitance, okay, and you have a 2 down there. So it is C over 2, C naught over 2, okay. 
Now for the next part, we have to work out potential difference, the new potential difference between the plates in terms of V0. So we know that V0 is Q over C0, okay? And because we know that C0, or rather the new C, okay, is halved, that means that the new V is going to be doubled, okay? Because C0 is at the bottom. So that's just gonna be two V0. So really simple, okay? And then finally, we have the energy store. So energy store is E0 equals half V0 squared, C0, okay? So the new energy is, I'm just gonna call it E dash, okay, E0 dash, is, time, uh, is equal to half times the new V, okay, which is two V0, okay, squared, and the new C, which is C0 over two, okay? And once you tidy this up, okay, two squared is four, and um, you also have a 2 at the bottom, and therefore that ends up giving you a value of 2e0. Now guys, just to be careful over here, this half is standard, okay? So don't confuse that half with the, um, you know, the calculations, right? So just to be very clear, you have the new e0, which is half times, okay? So leave that half the way it is, and you have 4v0 squared times by c not over two, okay, and that cancels out to two. So just because you have a two there, okay, that means that the new energy is double the old energy because the old energy comprises of that half, okay? So yeah, that's why, just watch out for that kind of mistake, okay? Now, let's move on to part II. It says, explain in terms of forces between the plates why the energy stored increases, okay? So, well, because the distance is increasing, the work done against the attractive forces is also increasing. Therefore, the energy store increases. So we know that work done is force times distance, okay? As D increases, W also, or rather work done, I should be proper about it, work done against the resistive, sorry, attractive, my bad, attractive, forces also increases and therefore the energy store work done is the same as energy stored and that's why it increases okay so for part b we are given that a student discharges a capacitor of capacitance c through a variable resistor of resistance r using the arrangement below and the capacitor is made from two parallel metal plates separated by a sheet of paper of thickness that much and the area of overlap between the plates is that much, okay? The capacitor is charged fully by closing the switch S at time t equals zero, S is open, and the capacitor discharges through the resistor. After t equals t, the potential difference across the capacitor is halved, okay, fine. The student repeats this for several values of R, and he decides to plot t against R, okay? Um, to obtain a straight line, show that the line has a gradient of C lin two, okay? So let's look into the original equation and let's see what the changes, what changes are made. Okay, so we know that voltage is halved. So we can start off with saying that V is V naught E minus T over R C. Okay, so at time T equals that capital T, the new voltage is half of the original voltage. So it's going to be T over R C like so. So that means that if we just rearrange, okay, divide both the sides by V0, and we have basically half, okay, equals E to the power of minus T over RC, we can um, use natural logs, okay, lin both the sides, and flip them, okay, I'll just do all the steps, just to be very clear, okay, so when you get lin of half is equal to minus T over RC, you want to have a positive sign in front of T, so you would basically flip. Um, and it will become lin2 equals t over r times c. Now, the gradient is basically t over r, right? So t over r is therefore c times lin2, and that's it. That's your value of the gradient, okay? At ii, the data points uh, plotted by the students are shown below, and we need to draw a line of best fit, um, and then use the gradient to calculate the value of c, okay? So I'm going to use my trusted ruler over here and 
try and see if I can use most of the points. And I'll just... Mm-mm-mm-mm. Okay. There. I think I've almost got it. Okay. Oops. Moved it slightly. Sorry. Okay, there we go. So, I have a line drawn through most of the points. Okay, done. And now, let's work out the gradient. So, I would use a different colour. Let's go for light purple, light pink, my favourite colour. And, got it. Okay, so, let's see this value. So, the midpoint is 0 0.11. So, this is going to be 0 0.114. And this is 0 0.07. Awesome. And so the gradient change in Y is going to be that. There's no, um, the units are like normal. And then in terms of the resistance, it is 20 minus 12 mega. Okay, so 10 to the 6. And so once I use that in my calculator, I end up getting a value of. 5.5 times 10 to the minus 9. And now I can work out the value of C because I know that C is equal, sorry, C is equal to gradient divided by lin 2. And once I pop that in, I end up getting 7.9 7 times 10 to the minus 9. So just to be clear, this is my gradient here. Okay, let's move on to question number 2. We have to Use your answer in part II1 to calculate the permittivity epsilon of the paper. Okay. So we know that uh, from the formula booklet that capacitance is equal to, by the way, this is capital C, not lowercase c, capacitance is equal to EM, um, sorry, uh, epsilon times by A divided by D. Okay. So therefore, epsilon is equal to CD over A. We've got everything, right? We've got the value of the capacitance, like so d which is the distance between and that is given or well the thickness which is given to me 8 times 10 to the minus 5 and the area of the overlap is 3.1 times 10 to the minus 2 and that would end up giving me a value of 2 times 10 to the minus 11 farads per meter okay let's move on to our next question number 23 so it says a gamma camera uh, has several important components, including a collimator, scintillator, and photomultiplier tubes. Suggest why a collimator needs to be long and narrow. Well, that is because we need the image to be generated being very clear. Okay, the gamma rays will travel parallel if the tube is long and narrow. Okay, so the image generated is clearer as the gamma rays travel parallel. Okay, state the function of scintillator. Well, that is what turns the gamma ray photons into light. So these are really straightforward questions based on theory. So if you know, if you remember your theory, you'll be okay in these ones. Okay, so for part C, we're given that in a single photomultiplier tube, a photon of light produces um, this much current and in these many seconds. Calculate the number of electrons responsible for this pulse of current. A very nice question. We know that I is equal to charge, which is N times E divided by, time, uh, divided by the time. Okay, so we are to work out N. So N is equal to I times T over E. Okay, and 0 0.32 times 10 to the minus 6 times by 1.2 times 10 to the minus 9, divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And that ends up giving me a value of 2400. Okay, state one diagnostic application of gamma rays, a gamma camera. Well, it can be used to detect cancer. Okay, next question is again on medical physics. Let's talk about uh, for part A, it says, describe in terms of X-ray photons the attenuation mechanism of Compton scattering. So, again, a very theoretical question. So, this is where an X-ray photon interacts 
with a with an electron in an atom and the electron gets ejected and the x-ray photon gets scattered with lowered energy. Okay, so followed by part B where it says a parallel beam of x-rays is incident normally on a tissue, like so, and we have been given the variation of intensity of the x-rays with depth in the tissue, and we are to calculate the attenuation coefficient or the absorption coefficient mu in per centimeters of this tissue. So we have a given equation in the formula booklet as I equals I naught E to the minus mu x, where I is the intensity of the transmitted rays and I naught is the initial. And so if I just put in the numbers, okay, so initial is three times 10 to the three, okay, and the final for one centimeters of depth um, is going to be 1.123, 1 1.3, 1 okay, times 10 to the 3 again. Um, so I can just simply use 1.3 times 10 to the 3 over 3 times 10 to the 3 equals e to the minus mu times x, which is in centimeters and therefore it remains as 1. And now, quite simply, I'm going to have to use logs again, okay, so lin of 1.3 over 3 equals minus mu okay and again when I put that in the calculator it will give me a negative value which will cancel out with the negative in front of mu okay so that is dot 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 and the answer is 0 0.84 per centimeters. For part ii use the graph to determine the exposure time for the, ta for the total radiant energy incident per centimeter squared at a depth of 1 centimeters to be 2.6 joules. Okay, so um, we have to calculate the time, exposure time, and we're talking in terms of energy, so let's look at the usual formula, energy is equal to power times time, and we are talking in terms of intensity, and we know that intensity is equal to power divided by the area incident. So therefore, if you combine these two, I can say that energy is equal to I times A times phi T, or therefore T is equal to energy over I times A. And we've got everything, okay? We've got our energy, which is 2.6 joules, divided by the intensity at a depth of one centimeters, which is 1.3 times 10 to the three. And area, now for area, because it is uniform, um, it says that the tissue is uniform, it is well, x is one point, sorry, one centimeter, so it's one by one, okay, centimeter squared. In other words, make sure that you convert it, okay, one centimeter squared, oops, centimeter squared, is 10 to the minus two squared, like so, okay, so it will be 10 to the minus four meter squared, okay, so once you pop that in to the calculator, you end up getting 20 as the answer. Okay, for our final part of the final question, it says beyond x, uh, as one centimeter, the tissue has a larger attenuation coefficient than the value calculated in part i. And we need to sketch the value, uh, sorry, the variation of i uh, with x beyond x as one centimeter. So for the att attenuation coefficient to be larger, it means that the absorption is more. So the intensity will decrease, intensity of the transmitted rays will decrease, okay? And because it's larger than uh, the one that we calculated, which is mu, as 0 0.84, the, um, there will be more absorption, and therefore it would decrease at a, initially at a faster rate, and then it would, it would basically be in an exponential decrease, okay? So if I start at one centimeter and go exponentially downwards, like so maybe, okay? It's not the best curve, but probably get an idea, okay? It won't go all the way to zero, that's important, and it should be a, a clear indication, oops, what happened there? There we go. It should be a clear indication that you, the, the, it's an exponential curve, okay? So initially, 
it has a larger gradient and then the gradient um, you know shallows out so that's your part i i i and that's about it so i hope you found this walkthrough useful uh, let me know in the comments if you have any questions and i'll see you next time until then look after yourself and thanks ever so much for watching